Hello, my name is Tim Rogers, and you are watching Kotaku.com. Final Fantasy VII was released 20 years ago. Shortly after that, I lived in Japan for 10 years. You can live in Japan too. Just do what I did, buy a one-way ticket. I'm playing through Final Fantasy VII in Japanese for the first time. This is part four of my series comparing the Japanese and English scripts. I'm noticing a trillion tiny little differences. I'd like to share a billion of those with you. Unfortunately, I only have time to share a million, so let's get to it. First off, I'd like to thank our friends at thelifestream.net for providing the English footage. We last left Cloud and Eirisu chasing after a chunky purple freak wagon which was carrying Tifa into the Sector 7 slums. Eirisu and Cloud run after the wagon to investigate. This is a red light zone called Wall Market. This is one of the biggest, most complicated, most culturally interesting set pieces in all of Final Fantasy VII, and maybe one of the most legitimately important sequences in all of video games. It's a role-playing game dungeon without a single battle. It's all dialogue, exploration, and hanging out in a living, breathing, weird-as-heck place. Cloud and Eirisu are going to learn that Tifa is auditioning to be the bride of the slumlord, Don Corneo. In order to infiltrate the Don's mansion, Cloud is going to dress up like a woman, which means collecting a dress, a wig, some perfume, some underwear, a tiara, and makeup. The sequence is almost inscrutably dense with Japanese cultural references. Wall Market itself draws influence from real-life Tokyo night zones such as Shinjuku Nichome, Yoshiwara, and Uguisadani. So, of course, the English version of this landmark video game scene, translated on an inhumanly short deadline in 1997, nails every single reference and treats the subject matter with delicacy, decency, and absolute cultural accuracy. Right? As soon as we get into Wall Market, a man tells us, Hey, you two. Why don't you get some rest? We have a beautiful room. How about it? This is the first line of dialogue we encounter in Wall Market, and it's wrong, wrong, wrong. Uh, in Japanese, he advertises the room as kirei. Choto, soko no futari san, skoshi yasunde kanai? Kirei na heya ga aru n dakedo dou dai? Roughly, he's saying, hey, you two there, why don't you rest a little bit? We've got some kirei na rooms. How about it? Kirei can mean pretty, though it can also mean clean. Look at the filthy place these characters are occupying right now. This guy's on the street shouting about the services of a business. I'm pretty sure he's touting the cleanliness of the place. Furthermore, he says, Skoshi yasunde kanai? Skoshi means a little bit. Yasunde kanai is a contraction of yasunde ikanai, which is a tag question way of saying, why don't you rest and go? Verb and go is a common Japanese verb ending. It is used to express an activity done either in a hurry or between multiple actions. This man, therefore, is advertising a hotel which specializes in temporary rest. Rest, Yasumi, or QK, is the popular Japanese hotel euphemism for sex. He's telling Cloud and Eirisu that if they want to have sex a little bit, which is why he presumes they are in this part of town, the rooms in that particular hotel are clean. Maybe cleaner than others nearby. It is typical, you see, for many such short-term hotels to exist in the same region. Google Uguisudani when you get a chance. Uh, yeah, so that gets us through one line of Wall Market. Look, I could do an entire two-hour video based on Wall Market alone. I know at least a hundred people would watch that. That's how many people emailed me with questions about Wall Market. For the sake of brevity, suffice it to say that the cultural nuance packed into this one seemingly insignificant NPC interaction at the very beginning of the zone is quite suggestive of the amount of flavor the English version misses. In order to get the tiara that Cloud will need to add to his woman costume in order to adequately impress the Don, you have to purchase an item from the vending machine of the hotel and give that item to the owner of a store in Wall Market. This is a weird sequence in the middle of of a weird sequence. It's awkward in either language. The owner of the store tells Eirisu to turn away so that he can talk to Cloud alone. The owner wants to know what's in the vending machine at the hotel because he sees himself as in competition with the hotel owner. He asks you to stay at the hotel and buy an item from the vending machine. If you buy the most expensive item and bring it back to him, he gives you the diamond tiara. That's the best one. In English, the shopkeeper refers to the item from the vending machine as a protein drink set. I was quite interested in what this would be in Japanese. In Japanese, he describes it as a Kiai Juten Drink Gold Setto, a Kiai Juten Drink Gold Set. Kiai means like fighting spirit. Juten means to replenish or to recharge, though it also means to reload, as in to reload a gun. So, the name of this drink is, like, Spirit Reloader. This is the name that makes it sound like one of the many, many varieties of energy drink you'll find in a Japanese convenience store. They usually come in these little glass or steel bottles, and they taste like Red Bull with half the water sucked out. Be careful, some of them have nicotine. 
Some of these drink containers' labels advertise aphrodisiac effects. I'm pretty sure that this Kiai Juten is supposed to be some kind of a boner drink. I mean, come on. In order to obtain the underwear that you'll need to complete your Girl Cloud outfit, you have to go into a place called the Honey Bee Inn. You get a membership card and you head over there. There's an inscrutable line in the English translation before you go in. The doorman acknowledges your member's card and invites you inside. Cloud then says, hmm. That's how you'll fool them. And Arisa says, Hmm, so that's how you fooled them. This makes no sense. This line puzzled many players of the game. After reviewing the Japanese version, I realized that this is just an honest mistake. I can picture the translator squinting at a spreadsheet on a CRT monitor in a dark office. He translated one line, left one line blank, consulted the game, got distracted, came back, and translated the same line again in a different cell. I presume the honesty of this mistake because in Japanese, Cloud actually says something not at all ambiguous or mysterious or even suggestive. Maybe this line wasn't even in the translator's spreadsheet. Maybe the translator your spreadsheet had Eris' line duplicated. That's probably it. Cloud says, There's something here I need for my girl outfit. I can just feel it. To which Eris replies, Huh? Hmm. So, is that how you fool people? She's playfully implying that Cloud probably likes going to hot girly zones in his free time, and makes bizarre excuses such as this one when doing so. Eadisu is being deadpan ridiculous here. We could translate this as, Oh, so is that your usual excuse? She's great. What a cool character. I love her. By the way, this place literally has the kanji for woman twice on its front doors. In order to obtain the best possible underwear with which to complete his girl costume, Cloud will need to enter the group room of this weird establishment and endure the company of energetic, muscular men. The leader of this group, Mukki, whose name is suspiciously identical in English and Japanese, calls Cloud Bubby. Hmm, I think maybe that's hilarious. In Japanese, he calls Cloud Bozu. Bozu can mean Buddhist monk, shaved head, or little boy. It means little boy because little boys in Japan often have buzz cut hairstyles, which is the hairstyle a monk would have. When Mukki asks Cloud how old he is, and Cloud says he's 21, Mukki replies that he's twice Cloud's age. So an older guy calling a younger guy Bozu isn't exactly 1000% quote unquote normal if the two of them are both adults. I'd put it on about the level of, say, Jay Gatsby calling Nick sport in The Great Gatsby. Mukki then asks Cloud if he wants to join his young bubbies group. Whoa. He doesn't use the word bozu here in Japanese, though. Rather, he refers to his seishun sakura, meaning seishun circle, seishun club. Seishun means youth, as in that thing we all have when we're young and want when we're old. If years of listening to Japanese rock music and watching Japanese TV commercials has taught me anything, it's that seishun isn't over until you say it's over. And even when it's over, you can get it back just by saying seishun over and over again, especially after taking a long sip of an ice-cold beer. Mookie's Seishun Circle is probably just a bunch of dudes going to a hot spring in the mountains once every couple of months to get away from the pressures of their high-stress work life. After the bath, when asked to stick around and play, Cloud declines. Here, Muki gives Cloud a memento, a pair of bikini briefs. In an alternate scene, yielding inferior underwear, Cloud passes out after having a vision of his past self. The honeybee girl calls for help. Cloud wakes up to Muki giving him a back massage. Muki heard the honeybee girl's cry for help and came running. The massage restores Cloud's HP and MP. Muki gives Cloud some general life advice about how youth, Seishun, is so short yet so long, etc. Let's give this next one your best shot, Muki says. Then he says, time's up, bye bubby. In English, the honeybee girl says, I'm so sorry. There's a lot of adult things going on. For your inconvenience, please take this, okay? She then gives Cloud some lingerie. In Japanese, there's a little bit more flavor here. Where Muki says, don't be so uptight in English, he says, you can't let yourself get nervous in Japanese. Where he says, let's give this next one your best shot in English, he's pretty much just saying, try harder next time in Japanese. If you run after Muki as he leaves the room, he says, you can't let this sort of thing get you down. So then in Japanese, before presenting Cloud with the lingerie, the honeybee lady says, Gomennasai ne, iroiro to otona no jijo demono ga aru no yo. Kore owabi no shirushi taise 
Tsitsinishite. I'm going to translate loosely because otherwise we'd be here all day. I'm sorry. This sort of thing happens all the time with adults. Please accept this as consolation. So what happened is Cloud passed out in this room because, well, in English, the name of the room is the censored room. In Japanese, it's simply the love room. Cloud passed out because, as we'll learn soon in the story, he's suffered a lot of emotional trauma and is not mentally well. However, we don't know this yet, making it strangely sly for the game to play it into a weird little joke. The guarded language of Muki and the honeybee, they're skating around the topic of Cloud's apparent sexual impotence. The joke is that Cloud couldn't perform. He got nervous, he passed out, whatever. And then the limit ran out on his time for the room with the girl. My conclusion, as a guy who coincidentally is wearing a shirt that says Viagra on it right this second, is that this scene is a straightforward, cheap joke about erectile dysfunction in Japanese. Meanwhile, in English, it's, well, I, uh, honestly don't know what it's trying to be about in English. I mean, man, they censored the word love. That's cold, man. Let's just get out of Walmart as soon as we can, because we have a lot of other stuff to cover and- Oh, God. Oh, for God's sake, did this guy just call Arisu a heifer? Hey, boy, you sure got a good-looking heifer there. Well, I guess I have to explain this. Uh, in Japanese, he refers to Cloud as Nisan, which just means big brother, which is a perfectly normal thing for a guy to call another random guy his own age. Uh, I'm sorry if that sounded like I was being sarcastic. It actually is annoying. He refers to Arisu as Beppin-san. Beppin is the kanji for other, juxtaposed with the kanji for goods or merchandise. In the strictest sense, of the etymology, it means extraordinary merchandise. However, we can change the second kanji to another one with the same reading, so that it now means extraordinary woman. This is a very common, uh, in, in the 90s anyway, slang term for a super duper hot girl. I do not know, nor am I prepared to speculate on why the translator settled on bovine terminology. I now begin to suspect that the translator grew up on a dairy farm. Cloud dresses up as a girl and gets into Don Corneo's house. Erisu and Tifa meet, they talk about Cloud, it's funny. Tifa reveals that she's here to get information. Don Corneo tells us that Shinra is going to collapse the ceiling plate onto Sector 7. He then dumps us into the sewer where we fight monsters, then we traverse a train graveyard, join Barrett at the top of the pillar, fight valiantly to try to defend the slums, lose the fight, oops, Arisu got captured, and we vow revenge against Shinra. Shinra's murder of thousands of innocent people in the slums of Midgar conveniently produced enough rubble for our heroes to climb directly into Shinra headquarters. There's a fan favorite line here. Barrett is suddenly a great optimist. He asks Cloud, in the presence of a long wire dangling down from the plate hundreds of meters above, What's that look like? Cloud says, just a normal wire. Barrett says, oh yeah? Well, to me, it looks like a golden shiny wire of hope. In Japanese, Barrett says the wire appears to him as a kin iro ni kagayaku kibo no ito. This is great. Kin iro means golden. Ni kagayaku means shiny. Kibo means hope. Ito means thread. He's saying the wire looks like a golden shiny thread of hope. This is perhaps a reference to the Ryunosuke Akutagawa short story, The Spider's Thread, Kumo no Ito. In this story, Buddha is enjoying a stroll through paradise. He looks into a lotus pond. He can see Heck at the very depths of the lotus pond. He sees a man in Heck. He knows that this man once avoided stepping on a spider out of compassion. Showing similar compassion, Buddha lowers a silver spider thread into the pond to allow that sinner to climb up and out toward redemption. I won't spoil where the story goes from there, though I will say right now that Eadisu is going to die later in Final Fantasy VII. Seriously though, I promise I'm not exactly reaching. Uh, Google that story, it's a good read. Anyway, our heroes climb up the spider's thread and arrive at Shinra Tower for yet another groundbreaking landmark video game set piece. Wow, that's two landmark set pieces right after another, all in the first five hours of the game. I wonder if this had anything to do with Final Fantasy VII being popular. This is a big deal for our heroes. Barrett's been fighting Shinra for years, and now here he is, risking it all to take the fight to their door. I hope they're all gonna be okay. And you hope so too. We'll see what they get up to next time.